Hello, I'm Pastor Thomas Wilder of the Bethel Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As we prepare to study God's Word, there is always so much in God's Word that He wants to share with us. So now get your pad, your pencils, your iPads, whatever it is you take notes with. Let's get into God's Word. Teach us, Father, the wisdom that has been held secret for the righteous since the foundation of the world. Open it up to us now that we may walk in it and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, all right, we're in Job chapter 3. We have been talking through Job. Uh, first chapter, it tells about all the good things that have been going on in Job's life and how God bragged on him and how God really was proud of him. And then chapter 2, uh, Satan begins to move his hand. His friends come. They sit down. And at the end of chapter 2, they've been sitting now for about seven days, so astonished at what had happened to Job that they didn't even open their mouths. They, they are just they're astonished. It, it's amazing uh, to them. Uh, and it says at the end of chapter 2, that they didn't even know in chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. When they lifted up their eyes, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice and wept. So he, you, you got to look bad when your friends come and look at you. They don't know you. And when they finally do recognize you, they're crying. They, they just, he just can't hold it within. Uh, so... Job's in a pretty bad situation. And so we're going to begin today with chapter 3. In chapter 3, Job begins to answer. They didn't say anything after seven days, but after seven days of them being there, we don't know how long it has been since Job's trials began, but we do know that it's been seven days since they got there. And so at this point, Job looks at them, uh, he begins to converse with them, and unfortunately, in this chapter, Job begins to curse the day that he was born. Now, that, that's a pretty bad situation, so uh, Job is not thinking of God. Job is not thinking of his um, condition. He uh, primarily, well, he is thinking about his condition, excuse me. He, he is thinking not about how to get better but he's thinking about how to get out of it. Things have become so bad that he's thinking, how can I get out of this? So let's read through it. It's, it's only 26 verses, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to talk about it verse by verse. But for the most part, the whole subject matter here, Job is asking questions about why am I even here? And there are times in life that things get so bad that sometimes you may wonder yourself, why am I here? Why did God let me be born? Uh, this is the kind of situation that he's in. So we'll, we'll run through this. Uh, we won't run through it, but we'll spend today on this. We'll talk about it, and then uh, hopefully next week, God willing, we'll, we'll go a little bit into what his friends had to say about him or had to say to him. So Job chapter 3, let's begin at verse number 1. It says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, there is a man that shall conceive. Let the day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come unto the number of the months. Lo, let the night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day, who are all who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light. 
but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day, because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not come? Why did I not come? Why did I not from the? Why did? <laughs> sorry. Why died I? Excuse me. That's why it didn't make sense. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees pre prevent me? Why the breast that should suck that I should suck? For now, should I have slain, lain still, and been quiet? I should have slept. Then had I been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth, which built desolate places for themselves, or with princes that had gold, who filled their houses with silver, or as a hidden untimely death, uh, untimely birth, I had not been, as infants which neither saw light. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor, the small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before my, I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly fear is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Now, whoo, uh, this is perhaps uh, the most depressing book in the Bible. Okay, this is the most depressing chapter, rather, in the Bible, uh, particularly when you look at verses 1 through 10. Uh, and so when Job is beginning to, to talk about his life, he is asking a series of what I call rhetorical questions. And the essence of these questions come to the point of asking, why was I born? Why was I allowed to live? So let's just walk through some of the questions Job asked. Uh, we may stop and dwell on a couple things around verse 20. But for the most part, Job is just asking questions. And so we will, we will look at the questions that he asked and, and to try to get a glimpse of how miserable things have become from him. Now, when we look at Job, chapter 3, as I said, the first 10 verses, for the most part, are the most depressing uh, verses in the Bible, and, and this is probably the most de depressing chapter in the Bible. Uh, this is after seven days of silence. Uh, Job began to curse the day of his birth, and the essence of the curse we'll find in verses two through eight, uh, and that is first he began to curse the day that he was born, and then he began to, to curse the night, and uh, again, he said some pretty ugly things here, but, but let's, let's talk about it. But, but, but when you get in trouble, when you, when you get in anguish, you say things you don't mean. That's why the Bible encourages us. You know, if, if, you've, if you've thought evil, the book of James says, put your hand over your mouth. Don't, don't, don't let that stuff come out of your mouth. Okay, just don't, don't. All right, so let's, let's talk about it. All right, now, I, in my notes, I have A through uh, H-A-J-K-L-M as we talk about the things that Job caused, or that I call the essence of the curse. Let's begin in verse number three. He says, the first thing, first part of this curse, let the day perish wherein I was born. Number one. Wipe that date off the calendar. If your birthday, let's say, is June 3rd, Job is saying, go from June 2nd to June 4th. Wipe June 3rd off of the calendar. That's a pretty bad thing to say about yourself. Second thing he says, let the night perish wherein 
I was conceived. Going down to verse 4. Again, we're just reading the curse that Job pronounces over himself. Let that day, that day when I was born, be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Don't even let the sun shine on it. Don't even let the day come. Don't let, and we know the sun doesn't rise or set. The earth just rotates, so it appears that it rises and sets. But, but, but just for the sake of discussion, he says, don't even let that day be regarded by God. Just let it, let it be darkness. Don't, don't even let the sun come up on that day. Verse 5, let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. So he's saying, wipe the day off the map. Don't, don't even let the sun shine. Let, let it be like that day never existed, that, that it never came. Verse 6, as for that night in which, back up to verse 3 when he says, there is a man child conceived, as for that night, let darkness seize it too. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Wipe it off the calendar. Let it not come under the number of the months. Lo, let, thy, let that night be, uh, let it stand by itself. Have all the rest of the days of the year, the 364 and one, uh, 364 and one half or one quarter, I forgot exactly which one now. But, but, but let that day, that, that, that whole day, take it from the 365 and one half days, let's say it that way. And put that day over by itself. So there'll be 364 in one half day. Let that day stay by itself. Don't even put it with the calendar. Let it be solitary. Don't, don't let any joy come in it. Verse 7, let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their mourning. So those who are ready to mourn, those who are ready to cry, let, let them cry for that day. Let it, let it be a cursed day. Let it be worse than, as we would say, Halloween. Let, let it be uh, the day when nobody regards it, okay? So not only is he cursing it, he's asking people who are professional cursers, let them come and let them curse the day. Like, like Balaam, remember Balaam was one who could put curses and hexes on people. And Job said, let people like Balaam come in, let them curse that day. So that on that day, you know, they used to say Friday the 13th was cursed. But, but let it be like a Friday the, the triple 13th. Okay, so 13 times 13. Let, let that day be cursed. Then he goes on down to verse 9. Let the stars of the twilight be dark. Don't even let the, the stars shine on that day. Let it look for light. Let that day look for light, but have none. Neither let it be the dawning of the day. Don't even let the sun rise, as we talked about. So verse 10, and the reason why I'm pronouncing all these curses, the reason why I'm asking for all these curses, because, one, that day did not shut up my mother's womb. When I was born, I'm cursing that day because that day did not cause my mama to, uh, to, to, to abort me or to cause me to be stillborn. That's the first reason. The second reason that I'm cursing that day is because, verse 10, is because uh, it nor hid sorrow from my eyes. It did not stop me from experiencing such a fierce sorrow. So all these curses he pronounces, and he tells you in verse 10 why. Because that day would, did not stop my mama from having me. And that day did not introduce me from all the sorrows that I'm going through right now. What a terrible thing to say about your own birth. Now, let's start at verse 11, and then we'll go down to verse uh, 19. What happens sometimes as difficulties come is that we begin to glorify death. Now, uh, let me say, uh, suicide is a very serious issue. It's very serious. And, and there are those that may be predisposed because of mental conditions to think more readily towards suicide. And, and I'm not at all 
lightly taking that, nor am I lightly saying people who have serious problems that those problems are not serious. But I am saying to you, nothing is worth killing yourself. Don't kill yourself over it. I know that there are people uh, who are in constant pain. Uh, I've, I've visited people, and they're in pain. Um, and, and, it's, and the pain is unbearable. And I, a pain that I can't even imagine and don't want to even try to imagine. Where every moment, if, if they have cancer, say, that cancer is eating at their body, and that cancer is causing all the nerve cells to, to be just, just on edge, and, and they are hurting, and it's in excruciating pain throughout their body. I, I, don't, I don't know what that feels like, but I am saying to you, don't glorify death, because even though this life may be tough, we don't know everything that, that goes on the other side. Now, we do have our faith. We do have the word of God, and we trust God. But to die without the Lord, as we go by what the Bible says, is, is, is not a blessing. It is not a blessing. So while you're going through this life, times get tough. It does get tough. But don't think of death as a glorified way of getting out of it. Don't think of that. Because there is an eternity on the other side of death. There is an eternity. Think of that, eternity. And if 16 years or 17 years or 18 years or 20 years or 25 years or 35 years, if, if that, let's say 35 years, if 35 years is causing you that much trouble, think of what that much trouble would be like if you had to live it for all eternity. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But Job here begins to glorify death. He is in such pain and such agony that he says to himself, death is better. And I'm sure there are people who do think that. But let's read verses 11 through 19. I've read them before. I think we're just, we're just taking verse by verse since we already read them. Job begins to ask some questions. Why did I not die? from the day I was born. Why did I, I not give up the ghost when I was born? Why was I not just born and died? The answer is this, because God has a plan for you, because there's a purpose for you, because there's a calling upon your life, because God made you for a purpose. You are not an accident. You are not even just a, uh, a biological accident. I know people have been born through incest. I know people that have been born through rape. I know all kinds of circumstances come that causes people to be born in this world. But even in those circumstances, God has a plan for your life. God has a good plan for your life. And it's not for you to be born and die. That's why Job was not born and then immediately died. Because just like Job, there's a plan for your life. Let's move on. So Job begins to ask the question, why didn't I die in or from my mother's womb? Why didn't I die immediately after I came out of my mother's belly? Verse 12, why did the knees prevent me and the bride, the breath that I should suck? So he's asking questions. In order for me, my mother to give me childbirth, she had to uh, voluntarily uh, allow me to be pushed through, um, through her body. And in order for that to happen, she had to, uh, to, to, to allow that by spreading her legs. And he's saying, why didn't she keep her legs closed so that I could not be born? And even after I was born, he asked the question, verse 12, why did she even nurse me? Why did her mammary glands give me nourishment to keep me alive? Why didn't they just let me die? Again, these, these are pretty serious questions that Job is asking because he's going through some pretty serious turmoil. Satan has come to God. Satan has said, let me touch him. Let me, let me do these things to him. Uh, well, actually, he asked God to do it. God, God said, no, I, I don't do that kind of stuff. So, so he says, he's in your hands. And so Satan put all this stuff on him, 
And now Job is asking these very serious questions. All right, let's go down to verse uh, 13. If I had died before I was born, or if I had died shortly after I was born, then now I should have been still and I should have been quiet. I should have been, I should have, I should be sleeping then had I been at rest. Now, let me tell you something here. Job didn't know that for sure. That's what he imagined. He didn't know that for sure. He didn't know that he would have been resting. He didn't know that he would have been sleeping. He didn't know that he would be still. He didn't know that he would be quiet. Because no one, well, there are, there are some people who said they have gone to hell and come back. And I've listened to some of those stories, and they're interesting. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not going to deny anybody's experience. But very few people have gone into hell and made it back to tell you what it's like. So don't, don't think that because you die that you're automatically going to be quiet, sleep, at rest, and still. Don't glorify death. All right, so let's, let's, let's move on. So Job is surmising that if I had died, right now I would be at rest instead of at turmoil. I would be asleep instead of being kept up by all of these sores and all this pain. I would have been still. I would have been quiet. Verse 14, I would have been, he says, with kings and with counselors of the earth because everybody dies. I would have been with rich people. I would have been with famous people. I would have been with kings. I would have been with counselors. I would have been with all the great people who have died and which died and left places for themselves. They died, but they left desolate places for themselves. If, if the above had happened, he said, I would have been dead and at rest with kings and with counselors of the earth, the highest offices in the state and their royal advisors, which built monuments and tombs for themselves, which they left desolate. They, they, they built all these, because some, the some of the people did think they were gods, some of the pharaohs, they thought they were gods. So they made all these monuments for themselves. But Job said they died and they left them. But at least I would have been with kings and with other people. Now, let's move on. We're just, we're just walking through Job's ideas. Verse 15. Or I would have been with princes that had gold and who filled their houses with silver. So I would have been with the famous. I would have been with royalty. Or, verse 15, I would have been with the rich. All of that, any of that, he, he tells himself, is better than what I'm going through. What I'm going through is so terrible and so tumultuous that I wish I was any place else but here. If I was dead, if I had been stillborn, if I had been born uh, and died shortly afterward, then I would have been either with royalty or with the rich. Verse 16, or if I had not been with the royal royalty, if I had not been with the rich, then at the worst, I would have been with those who never saw light. I would have been with other babies just like me, or as an untime, as a hidden untimely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw the light. So if, if I had died, I would have been with kings, uh, with royal people who made money for themselves. I had been with princes who had lots of money, lots of silver and gold, or at worst, I would have been with other people who also died in infancy, who never saw light, who never saw day. Anything would be better than where I am now. Verse 17. Now here's a verse that, that sometimes you hear that in death, and this part is true, in death, Two things that are ideal in death, according to Job. 
Number one, verse 17, the wicked will cease from troubling. They're dead. They can't do any more harm. Because after you're dead, in terms of doing good or wickedness, is over. According to my understanding of Scripture, all the good that you're going to do in terms of an eternal reward, you need to do in this life. You need to give it everything you can. You need to go wide open, passionately informed for God. You need to give, we need to give God all that we can give, all the service we can give while we're in this life. Because in the grave, he says, the wicked will cease from troubling. The other thing that he ide idealizes about death comes at the end of verse 17. There, the weary, those like me, will be at rest. I'll be at rest. And that's what he wants. He wants some peace from this. And remember now that when you're in a circumstance like this, that is what you want. All you want is some peace. That's all you want. You just want some rest. You just you want to get to a point where you're not suffering anymore, where you're not going through this anymore. You just want relief from your pain. And that's where Job is. I just want some relief. I'm tired of this. This is too much. Verse 18. There, in death, the third thing he mentions is that he idealized, the prisoners rest together. There, the prisoners rest together. They are in freedom. So number one, he says, the weary will see some troubling in death. The weary shall be at rest in death. Prisoners will rest together in death. There is freedom. But then at the last part of verse 18, he says, they hear not the voice of the oppressor. Not only are they at rest, there's nobody to harass them. There's nobody trying to take advantage of them. There is no boss. There's no overseer. There's no master. There's no one beating with a whip. There, the wicked will cease from troubling. The weary should be at rest. The prisoners will rest together. And they won't have anybody harassing or oppressing them. Verse 19. Again, Job is just idealizing what it would be like to be dead. And then he says in verse 19, the small and great are there. Rich people are there. Poor people are there. The wealthy are there. Well, that's the same thing. Rich people are there. Poor people are there. Uh, royalty is there. Peasants are there. Slaves are there. And there may be some masters there. Death makes everyone equal. Makes everyone equal. You can go to the grave and you can see great monuments built to people uh, with great wealth. But they're all dead. They're all dead. Every single one of them. And Job now is idealizing this place where he is not troubled, this place where he is not sick, this place where he is not infirm. Okay? So he says now that the small and the great are there. And then the last part of verse 19, the servant is free from his master. So after cursing his day, the day he was born, he idealizes what it would have been like to die, to be dead. There, we could see some troubling, six things. We could see some troubling, the weary will be at rest, the prisoners rest together, the, uh, there's no voice of the oppressor, uh, the small and the greater there, the servant is there. That's, yeah, that's six things, okay? So all those things he idealizes. Now he comes to a point that I think is very critical. And here's where we will begin to slow down a bit. Verses 20 through 23. Job now begins to ask some very serious questions. 
It is these questions that he's asking that's going to lead us to a greater understanding of our relationship with Jesus Christ and why a relationship with God is so vital. So, so let me stand up here because I'm about to get emphatic. Okay, so, so let's begin. All right, so beginning now in Job chapter 3 and beginning at verse 20, I want to read verses 20, 21, 22, and 23, and then we're going to talk about these and, and point to the fact that God wants a relationship with us, and that's why he sent Jesus Christ. Let's begin. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery? And life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for his treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom God hath hedged in? Very very important question, uh, particularly two of them, verses 20 and 23. And he asked the question, this is the question. Uh, so why is there, ori, the word for light, illumination is the exact word. Why is there illumination given to them that are sorrowful and those that are toiling? Let me tell you why so that you won't have to sorrow or toil anymore. Now, what Job is doing here, he's looking at his life, and he says, look, God has given me light. God has given me revelation. But still, Job wants to die. And, 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 and what God wants him to understand is, I didn't give you this light. I didn't give you this revelation for you to die in darkness. I gave you this light so that you can have something to go through the darkness. Now, why is that important? It's important because when God gives us his word, which is his light, it is his revelation, uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God gives you his word so that you can walk through the darkness, so that I can walk through the darkness. So when he asks the question, why is light given to him that is in misery? It's so that you can walk through the misery. Last Sunday, I preached on uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh and that God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Why did God tell him his grace was sufficient? So that he would have what he needs to walk through the darkness and to deal with whatever that thorn in the flesh may have been. That's why God gives you his word. That's why God sent Jesus Christ, so that in this world, where we are tempted to toil and to scrape, and when we're tempted to be in misery, that we might look unto him. That's what the word says. Look unto him and be enlightened. They, book of Psalms, they looked to him and they were enlightened. Their faces were never covered with shame. That's why, Job, God gave you that revelation. <clears throat> That's why you understood the things that you understood. That's why you went sacrificing. That's why God gave you that wisdom. And we'll see a little bit later, the other things that God gave him. We'll see in, in, in chapter 29, Job himself will say, God was with me. He was with me from my youth. He gave me understanding. He gave me light. I walked by the light of his countenance. Why did God give it to you? So that you could go through misery. So that's answer, that answers that question. He asked the question, why is light given to him that is in misery? and life unto the bitter in soul so that you could go through misery and so that you would not be bitter in soul. Illumination should go to those who want to get somewhere in life and who want to find better ways of doing it. That's why God gives it to you. If you're in misery, God opens his word to you so you'll know how to come out of the misery. If you're in darkness, God gives you his word, so you'll know how to come out of the darkness. If you're in trials, God gives you his word, so you'll know how to, to hold up uh, under those trials. That's why God gives it to you. Now, I want to spend just a little time here because I think it's important, particularly when we look at all the darkness that Job is describing here, 
it's important that we look at these couple of verses. I want to begin by looking at um, Psalm 43, and I want to look at verse number 3. Psalm 43, and let's look at verse number 3. Psalm 43, let's look at verse number 3. Job asked the question, in essence, God, why do you give life to those that are miser in misery? God's answer would be, so you come out of misery. So you won't be miserable anymore. Why do you give light to those? Uh, the second question, why do you give light or illumination to those who are bitter in soul? So that you won't be bitter anymore. That's why. That's why he gives you life. That's why he gives you light. Life here, uh, we're dealing with light first, but, but he gives you light so that you won't go through misery. So that you won't go through and be overtaken by the things that are temporary and that seem to disease or infirm you. All right, Psalm 43. Let's look at verse 3. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. What is it, why is the psalm asking for light and for God's truth? Because those are the two things, he says, that's going to lead me into your holy hill, into your tabernacle. When you show me your word, the entrance of that word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. When you show me your word, then I know the way out. That's why you give it to me when I'm miserable. You don't need necessarily to know you don't need God to deliver you out always. You need him to show you the way out, and that's what he's going to do. Turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I want to look at verses uh, 19 through 21. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 3. We want to look at verses 19 through 21. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Let me read verse 18 as well. John 3, we'll start at verse 18, we'll read through verse 21. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is a part. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness, and I'm going to add a word, and misery, rather than light, because the deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. And his deeds are made manifest that they are wrought in God. Those who love truth come to the light. Those who hate truth stay in the darkness because their deeds are evil. Let me give you one more verse. Let's go back to Psalms. Well, Pastor, why don't you stay in Psalms? While you were there. Well, I just didn't. How about that? Psalm. Let's go back to Psalm. Psalm 97. And let's look at verse 11. This is a verse I would really encourage you to, rem to commit to memory. So that when you go through times that may look like they're dark, you can just bring this up out of your spirit. Job is asking a question. Why do you give light to those that are in misery? The answer is so they can come out of their misery. That's why. That's why you give light. Why do you turn the light on to those that are in darkness? So they can come out of darkness. Why do you turn your headlights on when you're traveling at night so you can see where you're going? Why do you light a candle or get a flashlight when the power goes out so that you can know where you're going? 
Why does God send his word, his light, when people are in misery? So that they can come out of misery. Here's the verse I want you to memorize. Psalm 97, and let's look at verse 11. Psalm 97, 11. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Job, you're a righteous man. God gives light to you so that you'll know how to walk through the darkness. God gives gladness to you so that you won't be miserable. Light is sown. Light is thrown out there. Why? Just for the righteous. Primarily for the righteous. Wicked men, I think, sometimes get an understanding and inkling of God and they, they walk on it. But light primarily is sown for God's children. And gladness for the upright in heart. All right, let's go back then to Job. So Job is asking questions. Verse 20. Why is light given to him that is in misery? So that he can come out of misery is the answer. Job asks a second question at the end of verse 20. Why is life given? Why is life given to those that are bitter in soul. Why is life given? Now, when you look at the word life, uh, it is the word she, that's how I would pronounce it. And the, the idea uh, for this word she is that it means strength, it means flesh, it means merriment, it means to be alive, it means uh, to, to have invigoration. Why, Job asks, is it given to those that are in pain or in bitterness? Bitterness here means great heaviness of soul, emotion. So he's asking primarily for himself, God, why did you give me revelation? If I'm in misery, why did you give me life when I'm in pain? Well, let me tell you why God gives life to those that are in pain. Because God wants you to come out of pain. Simple. I give you light so that you can come out of darkness. I give you life so you can come out of death and pain. The thing that's agonizing your soul, the thing that's agonizing your spirit. I give you life. I will give you merriment. I will give you uh, joy to those who are in bitterness. There is a, a verse that says, you have turned from me my mourning into dancing. Not mourning as in M-O-U-R, I mean M-O-R-N-I-N-G, but M-O-U-R-I-N-G. And let me see if I can find that verse because it just hit my, my spirit. And, uh, and let's see if we can find that because I want you to see that verse. It says, you have turned from me my mourning into dancing. Let's see if I can find that verse very quickly. All right. Let's look at Psalm 30. Surprised I didn't write it down in my notes. Psalm 30, let's look at verse 11. Psalm 30, verse 11. So why do you give revelation, which is another word for light, to those that are in misery? To bring you out of misery. Why do you give life, she, merriment, when those that are in death? To bring you out of death, to bring you out of sorrow. Because a merry heart, proverb says, is good like a medicine. So in your time of trouble, in your time of agony, God many times moves from the inside out because that's where your greatest pain is. Most of the time, uh, it is on the inside. But if you can get joy on the inside, that's why God gives you life. So you can have joy from the inside. Proverbs again, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. So there are times that God doesn't give you things. He gives you himself. Because no thing 
will ever do for you what the presence of God will do. There is nothing in this life, and there are a lot of nice things in this life. There are a lot of nice places in this life, and I want to go to just about all of the nice places. I want to, I want to see the world. But you know what? There is no joy like knowing Christ. All right, so we're looking at Psalm 30, verse 11. Here's the verse. It says this. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth, which is a mourning cloth, and girded me with gladness. That's why God gives you life. Job asks, why are you giving life to somebody who is obviously dying on the inside, who's obviously in pain. And God says, I'm giving you life because I want to turn your mourning into dancing. And at the end of Job, that's exactly, well, not exactly, but, but God does turn, the Bible says, the captivity of Job. God gave him life. God gave him understanding uh, of what was going on. God finally did remove the sickness. But God says, I'm going to heal you when you begin to pray for those that are saying all these ugly things about you. I'm giving you a spiritual life, and that's why uh, I'm giving it to you. Let me read just a couple of other verses. Uh, those that are bitter in soul or those that have heaviness, both the bitter and the miserable long for death. And it doesn't come soon enough. But God answers Job. Well, it doesn't. The answer to Job's question is that God gives you those things because God wants you to come out of both miser miser misery and bitterness. So Job asked the question, verse 20, why is there light to him that is given to him that is in misery? Because God wants to bring you out. Why does God send Jesus to those that were in sin and the wretched, the wretched and the poor? Because God wanted them to come out. Why did God send Jesus to the cross as we get ready for Resurrection Sunday? Because God wants us to come out of sin. Why did Jesus hang around the publicans and sinners? Because they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. That's why he does it. Let's go to verse 21. Back in chapter 3. The bitter in soul and the miserable, those are the two he's talking about here when he says which long. The bitter in soul and the miserable long for death, but it does not come. They dig for death more than for hid treasures. Here is the fallacy. Instead of digging for death, Dig for life. Dig for light. Dig for life. My words are life unto those that find them. It is medicine, the book of Proverbs says, to all their flesh. But the way the flesh does is that when it gets in misery and when it gets to the point where it is in turmoil, it seeks ways to kill itself. It smokes itself to death. It drinks itself to death. It puts stuff in its body to kill it prematurely. It takes an overdose of this or an overdose of that. It drinks too much. It, uh, and I've known of people that wanted to kill themselves but didn't know how, so they just stepped out in front of oncoming traffic, hoping that somebody else would do it. I heard, I read the story, I didn't read actually, I, I saw the um, it was called, I think, The Last 48, about this famous musician. And the Bible, the Bible, the, the person who made this documentary on him said that he was addicted to drugs, he was addicted to pornography, he had a very, very deep and dark spirit on him. And he wanted to kill himself, but he didn't know how in essence. And so he did something that he knew would bring sudden death. And that is he went and he provoked someone that he knew would kill him because this person had told him, if you ever do that again, I'm going to kill you. And so he went and did the very same thing this person had told him 
if you ever do it again, I'm going to kill you. Why was he digging for death? Because of the misery. Because of the torment of his soul. You want to know why sinners sin? Because of the torment of their soul. That's why God gives life. That's why God sent Jesus. That's why God gives us his word. That's why God sent you into the world if you're born again. That's why God sent me into the world. That's why he commands us go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because there are miserable people. There are people who uh, are, are, are dying on the inside and they need life and they need life. Because as verse 21 says, they are digging for death more than for hid treasure. And the Bible says God's word is the treasure. So if you seek my word as the treasure, I tell you what, let's look at that. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Let me show you that promise. Proverbs chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse, hmm. I'll start at, start at verse 1, go down to verse 6. Proverbs chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, going down to verse 6. My son, or my daughter, if thou wilt receive my words and have my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lift up thy voice for understanding, she is a part. If thou seeketh her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasure, then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So if you seek him, he says, I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you knowledge and understanding. But you got to search for it like you do hid treasure. The wicked, he says, the miserable. He didn't, say the, he didn't say the wicked. He says the miserable and those that are in torment, they dig for death as they would for hid treasure. Because they want to get out of their misery. They want to get out of their torment. But I would encourage you, if you're going through misery, if you're going through torment, seek for light and seek for life. Because God gives both of them, light and life, if you'll just ask. All right, let's go on to verse 22. The wicked again, not the wicked, but the miserable and the bitter rejoice exceedingly, and they are glad when they can find the grave. How sad. But they would be even more glad if they in this life could find life and light through God's word, God's word. They think they're glad when they go to the grave. And Job is imagining this. This is his, this is, I hate to use the word fantasy, but, I won't, and I won't use that word. Uh, there's another word I used earlier. This is his illusion. This is his summation. That the wicked are glad, when, I mean, that the miserable and the tormented are glad when they die. But God says to us, you don't have to die. You don't have to die. I'll give you life right now, and I will change your misery into joy. I will change your torment into life instead of death working in you I'll work life in you and so please 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 listen to God as he speaks even in the midst of what Job is going through let's look at verse 23 Job asked the question again why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God has hedged in well let me give you the answer he asked the question, why is light, another word for light is the word revelation, why is revelation or illumination 
given to a man whose way is hid or concealed. That's what the word uh, is, is the word uh, uh, which means concealed or to be hidden carefully or kept secret. Why do you give light or illumination to one whom you have hidden his way from him? Let me give you the answer. So that you can search it out. Why, Job says, do you give light to one that you've hedged in? The answer is ding, 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 ding. So you can find your way out. If you're in a dark room, and let's say you're going through one of those mazes. All of you have seen the little rats go through the maze, and some of you may have seen the little puzzles that you have to start at one end and figure your way out. Let's say you're in a dark room and you're going through one of those, and somebody hands you a flashlight. Illumination, verse 23. They gave you that because the way is hidden from you in the dark, but if I give you a flashlight, that gives you illumination so you can find your way. If I've hedged you in, putting you into this maze, and gave you a light, it's so you can find your way out of it. Job asked the question again, why is revelation given? Because God had given him great revelation. That's why he was rich. That's why he had all these things. That's why he did sacrifices. And you'll see a little bit later in, in, in chapter 29, he'll talk about all the great wisdom, all the great understanding that God given him, how, how when he opened his mouth, everybody else shut up. When he walked in the city, people stood up and, and paid attention. When he started talking, the princes just, just hushed. Because God had given him all that light. And now he's asking a question because adversity will make you ask questions like that. But if you back up a little bit, just back up and understand that God gave you light. God gave you revelation. God gives us his word so that when we are hedged in, we can find our way out. When our way is hidden, we can use his word to find our way out. So Job asked, even in cursing his day, he asked two questions that if he had answered them properly, that would have helped him, and he does realize at the end, that would have helped him come more quickly out of his adversity in terms of inwardly. He couldn't make God remove uh, all the things that, that, that was there, but in terms of his transformation, his enlightenment, he could have gotten it better if he had answered his own questions. And the first question was, why does God, verse 20, why is light given to him that is miser in misery, like me? And the answer is, so that you won't be miserable anymore. Why is life given to a person who is bitter in soul, like me? so that you won't be bitter in soul anymore. Verse 23, why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, like me, so that you can find your way out? Why is life given to a man, light given to a man whose way God is hedged in? I can't get out any way, you, 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 any way there is, so that you can find your way out. Verse 24, for my, my, my signs. So he's talking about himself. For my signs cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like water. So he's talking about the torment of his own soul now. I'm, I've, I, I, I'm, even before I eat, I'm groaning, I'm mourning, uh, I'm rumbling, even before the time of enjoyment when I eat. And my roarings are poured out like, they're coming out of me like waters. Because the thing that I feared, verse 25, the thing that I feared greatly has come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is coming to me. What was I afraid of? That I was not in safety. Neither had a rest. Neither was I quiet. Why did Job fear that? I don't know. I don't know. But somewhere down in his heart, 
this fear was there. And this is the thing that came upon him. I'm not going to go through fear, but I do want to read to you one verse. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I'm going to break my promise and read to you two verses. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfected love casts out fear because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That's chapter 3. The essence of it is that God gave him light. God gave him light so that he could work his way through it. But verse 25 tells us, 25 and 26, tells us how this door was open because of fear. And it's because of Job's fears that things happen. We'll pick up there next week. I'm a little bit over time, but we'll pick up there next week coming into chapter 4. Uh, as I'm going to try my very best, but I, I'm going to tell you, though, probably when I get to 20, 29, I'm going to slow down a little bit because there's so much in it. I may slow down before that, but, but I'm going to try to take a chapter a week so that it doesn't bog down. But I, we'll pick up chapter 4 next week. Thank you so much for watching and for being a part of the service and the study tonight. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. And as it has been a blessing to you, use what you've learned. Let, let God show you that he gives you light. He gives you revelation. He gives you his word because he wants you to come out and live it. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Have a good evening. Listen, thank you so much for being with us tonight as we've opened up God's Word. And we pray that as we've opened up the Word, that God by His Spirit has opened up your hearts to receive what He has to say to you. Listen, everything that God says to you is good and it's for your good. So take it now and use it. Put it to work in your life and watch God make a difference. Thank you again for watching.